Welcome to Heartbeat Christian Academy and this is Christian Basics 2. I'm always so happy to spend time with you. You don't realize this means a lot to me that you are taking your time to do these studies and go through this information. And what I've seen in my own life is it can only bring forth fruit. You know, when the word is sown, it is always sown with the expectation that a harvest is coming. And if you can believe it, you can receive it. Now you've done Christian Basics 1, I suppose, and now we are completing Christian Basics 2. So I do believe that there's a lot of word that's sown in your heart and that you are going to start seeing those results if you apply God's word. Now before we get into the lecture and we just have a bit of a discussion, there's the banking details if you want to contribute and minister with us and be partner with us. And there's also the contact details if you need to get hold of us for any reason whatsoever. Yes, today we, we are ending off uh, Christian Basics 2. And if you recall, and I'll just recap with you, we've spoken about financial wisdom. Uh, we've spoken about prayer and, and we've spoken about the new covenant and, and we're ending off the new covenant today. When we spoke about prayer, we, we were speaking about the different forms of prayer, motivating to pray, the methods of prayer. And I trust that this has changed your life, that your prayer life is now where it's supposed to be and that God is really using you through prayer using your mouth to declare what he wants to declare on this earth and if you if you haven't gone through those lectures then you can go do them that's the nice thing everything is available online uh, but it, it will change your life and as i've said in that lecture every year it changes my life when i go through those lectures again then also uh, like when it comes to finances you know i i see so many christians battle with finances so many christians they uh, they never get free financially they don't know how to see god as steward and as source and they're always trying to make ends meet and just trying to survive uh, so many times in life i've seen where people have practiced these principles of finances and they actually do them uh, it's not just about reading them in the book and completing your workbook that's great but it's about applying what the Spirit of God is saying to your heart. And if you apply those principles, they will really open doors. I mean, I've, I've said this in those lectures and we spoke about it. But uh, it was a, it's been a miraculous journey to see how God would take your seed and multiply it. And just open up the heavens as you become obedient to Him. Just seeing Him as your source. Not trying to be a, a dam, but being a river. Uh, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit what does God want you to do with the assets and the finances and, and the authority and, and the influence that he is, he is trusting you with? That is the, the essence of those lectures. So that was exciting to share with you. And then, you know, we started talking about covenant and we spoke about the blood covenant, uh, the principles of the blood covenant, the basic things about blood covenant. And then we spoke about Abram's covenant and then uh, the last lecture i spoke about handling the new covenant with skill where we start stepping into uh, this covenant that god has for us what does god have for us what is our agreement with our father and how do we actually step into that now today we're ending it all very appropriately and we're going to be looking at the covenant meal and the, the covenant meal actually refers to the fact that we have to actually uh reiterate and remind ourselves because as human beings we are so prone to forget we are so prone to forget what our authority is what we have in christ what is available for us that every time we do what is known as as the uh, the lord's supper uh, um, you know taking communion every time we're not only declaring to the powers and the principalities of the air the blood of jesus the bread his body that he that he gave on the cross the lamb that died everything that we're going to be talking about today we're not just doing that but we're also reminding ourselves as christians and saying to ourselves man what is what has god done for me what is my rights what do i have as a son and how do i step into it uh, a lot of times we get to a point where we we're not seeing those things in our lives and and when we when we when we partake of the covenant meal when we partake of communion when we do that we end up uh, sitting in a situation where, where we are forced to look at it and to say to yourself, okay, what was part of this covenant? And by now, you know, having gone through the different uh, covenants, the blood covenant, talking about Abram and the father of faith, uh, you should have a good understanding of the power of that. 
because a covenant is irrevocable. So we have something. Uh, you have a, a testament, a, a, a will and a testament, a final will and a testament in the New Testament where you see what Christ said, what He did. You, where you see where the Apostle Paul and Peter and John and James and all of those wrote for us so that we can see what we have. And now it's for us to discover that by the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the confirmation of the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit in our hearts and then to step into it. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper, as we, we, do, we do what is known as communion, it's not just a religious practice, it's a relational practice. It's, the, it's, it's sort of renewing our vows and our, uh, and our commitment to Christ uh, publicly, uh, also to the powers and the principalities of, of the air, because I believe that the enemy hates it when we, when we practice communion, when we, when we enjoy this covenant meal together, because it demonstrates to the enemy uh, what he has lost. It demonstrates his defeat. It demonstrates Satan's defeat. And Satan can then publicly see that he has no jurisdiction, he has no right, he has no authority over us. And uh, it rightly starts off where we talk about the Passover, because this is sort of the type that we see under the old covenant of God's people sitting in Egypt under tremendous oppression. So as we get into this lecture four, I want you to grab your pen, grab your notebook, grab your manual. Let's get into this and, and let's see. We will complete our questionnaire later. We will do that. Yes, we have to do that or our online assessment or whatever. But now we first have to open our hearts and open our spirits because uh, it's been it's actually been two days that I've been fermenting, <laughs> if I can say that with this before I actually wanted to bring it because I wanted to do it justice in the spirit. I didn't just want to do it yesterday. I wanted to offer this lecture, but then I felt I was tired. I was not uh, I didn't have the sparkle in my eye because I had a few issues that I had to go sort out. So I thought, no, let me do this correctly. Let me not dishonor this lecture or dishonor, uh, you know, what we're doing here. Let me do this the right way because this is critical for us. Uh, I hope that this revelation of the new covenant is burning in your heart already. But after this lecture, I trust that you will just step into what God has for you. So exciting. So let's get into this. We're going to be talking about the Passover, uh, the background, the ritual, the application. We're going to be talking about the Lamb of God, the birth, uh, the entry of Jesus, uh, the interrogation. We're also going to be talking about the covenant meal, uh, the, uh, the song of praise, the crucifixion uh, in remembrance uh, you know, of Him. And then man must examine himself. Uh, yeah, the outcome is teaching the, the principles and the practice of the covenant meal. Describe the symbols involved and bring focus to bear on Christ so um, it's about Christ so let's uh, uh, get into this um, Eastern practices uh, and like I say you can read through all of this there's some very interesting reading in this in this particular section so you can really read through it a few times like I did just read over it a few times I won't be covering everything but I, I want to hit some of this stuff uh, and, and make sure that those things are focused and elevated. Uh, Eastern practices, you know, it just says, yeah, uh, it talks about an Oriental will never have a festive dinner with just anybody as it sim symbolizes a covenant of peace. So uh, in the Eastern practices, when you eat together, you are making peace with that person. So it, you won't just eat with anybody. And um, it was just uh, mentioning here in the Africa Afghanistan Russian war that if they slipped in and they would have a meal uh, you know these people would be actually if, if they would have a meal undercover without being discovered they would actually have a covenant of peace without even doing anything because they they would have honored the, the practice higher than the conflict that they had between the nations uh, Afghanistan and Russia so it, it's, it's again just you know, in our situational context, uh, we will eat with people. Sometimes we sit in a restaurant with hundreds of people. There, it's nothing. But in their, uh, uh, you know, in their context, if they ate with somebody, it was significant and, and in many instances uh, seen as a covenant of peace. And there are some examples mentioned, uh, you know, of these types of meals as well, where we talk about Abram and, and, and God and, and, and Jacob and Laban. 
So you can look at those. And then we talk about the background of the Passover. Now here you have Moses and you can read all about Moses. Uh, you know Moses uh, was one of the escapees. He was supposed to be killed, but uh, he floated in a basket. He went to Pharaoh's palace. He was trained, educated in, in the traditions and the idolatry of Egypt. Very well trained there. Um, obviously received defense force training um, and he was ranked a general but at the age of 40 he had to flee um, uh, to Midian because he, he killed an Egyptian. He was scared of his own life and then married uh, Zipporah. And at the age of 80, uh, God calls him by the burning bush. We, we know this story. And then also he appeared before Pharaoh by, by, by the age of 80. You know, he was a shepherd. So uh, uh, there's a connection between shepherd, sheep, smelling like sheep. Um, and then also he, he, he you know, he... he this, the snake is, is quite a good one because if you read this, uh, Pharaoh's crown was actually a snake. Um, so a coiled snake, a golden snake uh, that was on his head. And if you looked then at Pharaoh's eyes, you would actually look into the eyes of the snake. And, and you will see that you remember the snake in the garden that deceived Adam and Eve, and uh, which we call original sin. There is always this connection with the snake in the Bible where, where um, we see the, the snake as, as Satan and as the enemy. And, um, you know, Moses and the magicians, we also see the, you know, the, the interaction with them and the snake there. What uh, the, the basis was here yeah, is um, through this act, God predicted that he would take the snake of Egypt by the tail and swallow it. Uh, it was also, a, a, you know, a, a message to the snake worshippers and uh, I, I gave a teaching on this one day you know that the gods were dethroned the god of the Nile the god of the frogs the god of the harvest every with the plagues with what God did during that period of history every god was dethroned in in, in Egyptian mythology and religion so it, it's for us again we read these things we don't understand it but everything God has done uh, was was purposeful and everything that we see in the old testament what happens with the hebrew people god's dealings with the hebrew nation I, abram isaac jacob uh, you know the kings uh, the, the 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 prophets every single dealing if we really look at it we will see there are types and shadows that we can see uh, for the new covenant and that is what we're going to get into here as we go to sort of the ritual of the Passover. Now it says here on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according uh, to uh, his household of his father. And it says that your lamb shall be without blemish, a male um, of the first year. You may uh, take it from sheep or goat, and now you shall keep it until the 14th day. So this was the, the institution on the 10th day of the month. This refers to the 10th day of the month of Nisan. According to the Jewish calendar, it is about the middle of March, April. Um, it was the first day of the Passover when they had to take a, a year old lamb and scrutinize it for three days. So they had to scrutinize it and make sure it had no spot of blemish. So the lamb was investigated for three days. And then um, on the 14th day, uh, on the third day of examining the, the fourth month, the lamb would be slaughtered. The blood would be collected and applied to the doorpost uh, with Hishab bronze. Now we can just see the blood, you know, and, and we spoke about this in blood covenants, but the life is in the blood and, and uh, the blood of an innocent lamb covers and atones the sin. So when God sees humanity, he looks at the blood of, of the life of the blood of the innocent that atones for, for the guilty. And yeah, also the blood has a protective function when, when the angel of destruction travels through Egypt and kills every firstborn. All those inside, uh, having the Passover, being inside, they were protected. And it's the same with us. Those that are inside of Christ, they are protected against the wrath that's coming on the earth. If we look and read the book of the Revelation, it, you have to be inside of the lamb inside of the passover and the lamb must be inside of you uh, as you will also see when you've had that meal so 
there's a lot of symbols here and i mean you can have message upon message on this we're just going to run through it quickly so you can see the symbol and get to the actual meal that we are supposed to have uh, you've got the, the 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 roasting of the meat and the breaking of the bones fire speaks of the wrath of god the judgment and then also the breaking of the bones referred to an uh, uh, an age-old tradition among shepherds according to this tradition the four legs of an obstinate uh, disobedient sheep was broken uh, to ensure the safety of the sheep so that's just something else then the meal the whole lamb was to be consumed there was nothing to be uh, taken over so the lamb was inside the family um, and the nation had to eat it fully dressed uh, uh, sort of in haste uh, with their weapons because this was the night the institution of the passover was the night if you remember in the history and in the old testament it was the night when the angel of death went through egypt and all of those hebrew people that were having the passover inside of their houses with the blood applied with the bronze around the post all of them were protected they were under the blood those even if they were hebrew people even if they were god's people and they were not they were they were not protected um, so this is also for us an indication that we must be sure that all our family members are saved, are born again, are spirit filled. They've they've um, accepted Jesus, the the Lamb and the Atonement sacrifice. If they haven't, then obviously when when destruction comes, they will not be uh, protected because they won't be under the blood. This is quite a serious thing, and that is also why we pray for our family and our friends because we want, like yeah, in in the case of these Hebrews. We want our entire family to be blessed. Now also there's some symbols as far as the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs are concerned. Level is a sim symbol of, of sin and uh, you can read of those things. Uh, the fact that they were gritting their shoes and their staffs, they, they were ready to go. Um, you know, for, for me also, it talks about, in personally, it talks about readiness. Though while they were eating, they had to be ready to depart suddenly. This is why they had to be gridded and they had, the, they had to have their shoes on their, and their staffs in their hand. So we must also understand that there must be a readiness in the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, we must be ready and, and we've got, in, uh, when we talk about the, 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 um, the armor of God, we've got the shoes on our feet for the preparedness for the gospel. And uh, so the church has to be in a ready position. The church cannot be reluctant and and just uh, uh, falling asleep in this culture and saying well you know whatever will be will be now the church has to hear uh, those who are led by the spirit uh, they are the sons and the daughters of god according to romans 8 we have to have our spiritual ears open we have to hear uh, there's an apathy or a or a sort of falling asleep where the church uh, many are trying to actually put the church asleep to try and put the church in a position of playing church, just going and attending services, just relaxing. No, this Passover, if we look at it, and, and when, we, when, we, when we actually liken this to the Lord's Supper, and we liken this to what we have in the New Covenant, it brings a, 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 to our attention a, a readiness posture where we are ready as the church to give everybody an answer that asks, but where we are also um, making the most of every opportunity and using the time because the days are evil. The church must be ready. The church, the enemy is walking around like a roaring lion. And we here have to be ready. People are dying every day. They are entering hell every day. And as you are studying at the academy, you are studying for one thing. And that is to get a kingdom focus and a kingdom purpose so that you can fulfill your kingdom mandate. There's nothing more important on earth than doing what God called you to do. And as you, as you start looking at this covenant, this is the base. This is the foundation. This is your jurisdiction, your right, your authority. You know now who you are in Christ and you also know who Christ is in you. And then you can fulfill your destiny and do what you are supposed to do. So there must be an attitude of being ready. Then also um, the application. Uh, the, the, like I said, the blood on the doorpost is a, fam, all the, uh, is a sign. All the family walking to freedom when they had the lamb in themselves. Uh, this is the type, you know, the, the lamb is used by God as a symbol and a type. Uh, by, uh, by the end of Revelation, Jesus has been referred to as the lamb 22 times. So 
the Lamb of God. John even said the Lamb of God that takes away the sin. So we know that under this covenant, and we spoke about covenants intensely, but under this covenant, the old covenant, uh, we, we had the, this offering once a year. Uh, we had Passover and all of that. And, and all of these institutions, but we know that Christ came and He lived a sinless life under the law. Uh, a sinless life as the perfect Lamb. So when Christ died as the Lamb, as the sacrifice on the cross, His blood was adequate because He was the Lamb. And being God in, incarnate in the flesh, His blood is adequate to satisfy the, girls, the scales of justice for eternity. Um, so we know that is the lamb, the Passover lamb, uh, and um, we need to just look at that. Then we spoke about the unleavened bread. Um, for the Jews, the, the three unleavened bread loaves in the, in the, in the bag that they ate uh, symbolized Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, but when we pull it through the new covenant, it's the Father, Son, and, and Spirit. Uh, so it's the Trinity. So, But the Jews look at that as... Um, you know, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we talk about the cup. Um, you know, the, 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 it just says, yeah, just historically, that the, the cup was, uh, you know, taken out. The specific cup was taken out once a year. So let's, let's read it. During uh, the, the yearly Passover, it is the practice to set one empty space um, with one specific cup out of which no one ever drinks. Uh, or has ever drunk. For the Jews, this pointed to the branch of David, to the Messiah. So this Passover, actually, the table was set already for Messiah to come, for, 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 for the Lamb to come, for the Deliverer to come. And one day he would have that cup, drink that cup that nobody ever drinks, even in Judaism today, I believe, still, as they celebrate Passover, that, that empty space is still there. They're still waiting for Messiah, but Messiah came in the upper room and just before his crucifixion he, uh, he crucifixion he had this last meal with his disciples and so you can now see the types doesn't that sort of excite you to see that everything was fulfilled according to the ordinances according to the exact instruction in scripture it's so powerful to see god's plan and once you start seeing that oh it it, it unfolds to you and you cannot no longer doubt anymore then also Interestingly about the shepherds, there was a certain sort of uh, breed or chosen breed of sheep that was specifically uh, bred for Passover and, and that herd was kept in the wilderness in a specific place and uh, they were not to mix with other sheep and they were not to, to uh, they were the specific Passover lambs and they were guarded by the shepherds at night. And that was interesting when I started reading the second part when we talk about the Lamb of God uh, Jesus' birth uh, takes place, you know, uh, uh, at Passover. Uh, 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 Jesus was possibly be born on this day, the 10th day of the first month in Nisan. And then also the shepherds that, that, were, get, were, that were guarding the... the we, we, we reckon these were the shepherds that were guarding the Passover lambs. They were notified. Um, and uh, it's just significant connecting those shepherds, those lambs that, you know, here you've got the Lamb of God born and, and God communicates with the shepherds for a reason. We, again, we, we look at these things, we read and we think, okay, uh, we see the nativity in churches and the play and it's so beautiful and all of that. But we don't understand that there's nothing in the word that doesn't have a significant purpose. Yeah, the angels speak to these shepherds and, and we believe historically um, that these shepherds were the shepherds that were actually looking after the Passover lambs. And here, uh, the angels tell them that the lamb is now born. The main lamb, you guarding these lambs that will be sacrificed for the next few Passovers. And they will be the parents of those Passovers that will later, you know, be sacrificed on the same time when Jesus goes to the cross. So years later... After this announcement and after Christ was born, these same lambs, their parents were there uh, and they heard the message. Now, I'm not saying that the lambs only, but the shepherds and possibly some of those shepherds were still shepherds and they were still uh, looking after those Passover lambs. It's, it's just how God declares things. It's, it's so awesome when I read that. Uh, there's no coincidence here. Bethlehem also means house of bread. 
uh, you know, and Christ is the is the bread of life. So, you know, he's born in Bethlehem and, and, and he's born in the house of bread. Uh, again, like I said to you, John the Baptist here in John 1, 19 says, uh, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, all who were on the banks of the Jordan River immediately uh, knew that he was referring to the Messiah, the Passover Lamb. So um, John announces that publicly. So then also the word takeaway is a covenant term. So the Jews recognized it as a covenant term. Uh, it's so awesome. Uh, when the institution of the Passover, the, uh, or with the institution of the Passover, the lamb symbolically destroyed the snake of Egypt. Okay, so, so back then, the lamb symbolically destroyed the snake of Egypt. As Egypt left that night, uh, you know, when the Passover took place, they left. Their enemies blessed them. If you go read that scripture, you will see that uh, the Lord actually promised this to Abram in a prophecy. And, and then Moses gave the people the same instruction and said, go and ask the Egyptians for anything that you want. And as you leave Egypt, you will leave Egypt plundering those Egyptians. And uh, you can go read this in, in, in that scripture. They left Egypt with the wealth of Egypt. So the Egyptians just gave them everything. I mean, these guys had enough resources to build the tabernacle, even a, a, an entire calf out of gold they could build because of the way they plundered Egypt. And there's a type here as well as we, we go through our Passover, as we go through our acceptance of the land. There's not just the freedom from captivity as we see Egypt as the captive nation really oppressing uh, the, the, the Hebrew people, but the Hebrew people moving out of captivity, being set free by a mighty hand, ten plagues and and God's mighty hand upon the nation of, of, of Egypt, their enemies, but also walking out with wealth, with great wealth. And as they enter through the, the Red Sea, we also see the Egyptians that pursue them and try to attack them being destroyed. So there's a lot of types here. We see water coming out of the rock. We see manna coming from the sky, which is a type of, of God's provision in every area it doesn't matter if it's a desert it doesn't matter if there's no way you can survive he will still protect his children because they have a covenant there's an agreement we see them crossing over the jordan and a lot of times when 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 you, when you look at the crossing of the jordan river into the promised land years later and and walking into the land flowing with milk and honey you can liken the jordan to the water of baptism and you can even look at the at the red sea as the water of baptism but there's definitely the water uh, that is a that is a testimony we see the fire column the cloud um, you know the power of the of the of the spirit of god evident there so you know it's just so wonderful to see all these types and then we can understand what god has for us then also if we go back to the curriculum and we look at the entry of jesus in uh, in jerusalem uh, he entered uh, he entered during the Passover, and uh, they were singing Hosanna, and uh, and they were they were really just worshiping. But this was on the tenth day of the first month, uh, while the Passover lambs were being herded into the city through the sheep gate uh, to be taken to the temple for inspection. The Passover lamb Jesus was escorted into the city via another gate to the inner court of the temple to be inspected so questioned so he was questioned by by uh, the we know by the Jews there as as they engaged with him and then we also see the fig tree uh, you know when the first Adam failed he was covered he covered his nakedness with fig leaves and Jesus speaks to the fig tree and the fig tree dies and it also speaks of the sinful state so there's so many things that you can see here the interrogation that i mentioned jesus the lamb was led into the city like the sheep and yeah he's interrogated by chief priests scribes elders pharisees herodians sadducees um, he was questioned the lamb of god was examined and questioned for three days but in him they found no fault to blame him so um, it says here in Mark 12, but after that, no one dared to question him. And it was before the Sanhedrin and also before Pilate. 
Then we get to the exciting part. The, it's all been exciting, but we get to the real exciting part that I'm excited to share with you as we talk about this covenant meal. Now, it was the evening of the 13th day of the first month that Jesus and his disciples entered the upper room to celebrate the Passover. Take note uh, that the Jewish day starts at 6 in the afternoon. So here they, they entered to have the Passover meal. And Jesus at this Passover meal, in, in Luke 22, he declares this last verse. This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, which is shed for you. So when Jesus declared this, they knew. Um, many of them knew that, that this was referring to a, a covenant. Now, the table was set customary way. The cup on the customary place and Jesus took the cup and drank. Uh, then also, this is my body. Talking about the bread. This is my body given to you. Uh, the bread bag with the three loaves pointed here to the Trinity. Uh, the Israelites had in their hands a symbol of the Trinity for so many centuries, but they never knew it. Uh, the one bag with the three bread symbolizes the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Take the Son out and, and, uh, and came to earth and was broken for our sins. But the Jews, for the Jews, it still represents Abram, Isaac, and Jacob because they're still waiting for Messiah to come. So, <laughs> again, there's, this, there's these signs that we can see everything meticulously in a place. And uh, then we talk about the cup, the cup of the covenant of the blood shed, and the new covenant. And in Jeremiah 31, you can read it. It's, it's the first time used. It's, Jeremiah 31 is, is, is used the first time in about 500 years. So they knew that something was going on here. They, they knew. But still, it was a bit hidden from them because you know that they still ran away. They didn't understand. They thought it would be a physical restoration of a kingdom. Even when he spoke to them, they asked him. They said, when are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel. They they were expecting uh, because they saw him function in so much power with so much authority, and and they saw this for so many years that they thought that he was going to restore a physical kingdom, but they didn't understand that the kingdom that Daniel, the prophet Daniel, prophesied about, this kingdom that would last forever, this kingdom that would not be shaken, uh, this was the kingdom that he came to establish, and it's not a kingdom that comes with visible eyes. The kingdom of God is not a visible kingdom; it's a kingdom that's within us. But it's a forceful kingdom that's forcefully advancing and pushing back darkness as far as it goes. As we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, the darkness is pushed back into areas and people are set free, healed, delivered. Exactly what we saw Jesus doing. And we spoke about this last time. Where we said that Jesus is the radiant image of the invisible God. And we have this better covenant with better promises. So... Whatever Jesus did under the old covenant in terms of healing, setting people free, delivering people, uh, you, you know, uh, forgiving people, showing mercy and grace to people. Whatever we see there, we understand that uh, this is amplified in our covenant. And that is what we have. So if we're not living in that area. That's why a lot of people, when they have sickness on their body, when they're sick, they go and they take communion. Why? Because for them, it's, it's a reiteration of the covenant. They reminding themselves of the covenant promise. They're saying, you know what? I'm seeing sickness in my body, but by stripes I've been healed. So I'm going to take communion now to, to, to show to myself, to reiterate to myself, and also to de declare to the powers and the principalities in the air that I have a covenant agreement with God. I have a covenant agreement with Him, and there's nothing the enemy can do. The only person that can violate that covenant is me. I can... I can step back from that covenant. I can step back from what is mine. I can walk away from my inheritance if I'm ignorant, if I don't know what is mine in Christ. So then also um, they had a song of praise and, and, uh, and we also, uh, you know, <laughs> we have the praises. It says at the end of the Passover meal, they always sang a song of praise. This song of praise always spoke of the coming Messiah. So they would sing of the coming Messiah. Um, but we, we know that the Messiah has already come. Uh, then the crucifixion, uh, you know, at 9 a.m., uh, a specific time for the lambs to be taken to the temple 
to be slaughtered at 3 p.m. Jesus was crucified. So, you know, with the lambs. But since that day, you know, no other sacrifice was necessary. The Passover lamb had, had paid the full price. The Passover lambs were a type and a mirror and a beacon that pointed to the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. None of the Passover lambs slaughtered from that time have been valid because Jesus was the last Passover lamb to be slaughtered. Jesus' legs were never broken as it would have made the sacrifice unacceptable according to the institution of the Passover with Moses. So he's, that, that is another, uh, most of the time legs were broken because uh, th that was sort of what they did to, to ensure that those people were dead. But in this case, Jesus' legs were not broken. So then also uh, Jesus, you, you, you know, he, 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 when he died, he, the veil too, when he said it was done, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. And when we, when we think of the veil tearing open as far as, as the holy place or the most holy place is concerned, we understand that that meant that the, the deep areas of God, the holy things of God, all of a sudden became accessible to us. What a wonderful thought if we, if we think about that. Just think of what we have in Christ Jesus. And, you know, this was only seen by the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement as he entered in. And all of a sudden it became visible to those who were at least in the temple and temple service, those who, who, uh, who saw the table of the incense altar speaking about prayer, those who saw the bread speaking about the bread of life, you know, uh, those who saw the candle with the light and the oil of the anointing speaking about the Holy Spirit. So those who were, were, were in, the, in the inner court of the temple, uh, the holy place, at least in the holy place, now all of a sudden had access to the most holy place. Which means that we can't be outer court Christians, um, you know, s s remaining at the sin altar. Uh, you know, we have to understand that the price Jesus paid was paid in full. So we don't want to be at the bronze sin altar with the water lavender standing there outside the tent, outside the main area. We have we want to enter into the area where the Holy Spirit is, where our prayers are, where the oil of the anointing is, where the bread of life is. We want to enter into those areas so that when the when 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 we enter into that we 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 have to then understand what the new covenant did the new covenant jesus's death the lamb opened up the veil now a lot of christians they still staying here in the outer court they staying at salvation they, all they do is salvation, salvation, salvation. So they at the bronze altar, they're just bringing sin offerings, guilt offerings. They're always conscious of their own efforts, their own performance, trying to serve God with, with their way of doing things, their law, what they can do. So that, that is a form of Christianity that's hard work, but it never gets into the integrities. Other, other Christians are in the inner court. They have, they have been given their lives to the Lord. They've been washed by the blood and they, they, they in that in the inner court, they're experiencing prayer, the incense altar, they're experiencing the Holy Spirit, the candles, the light, the oil of the anointing, the bread of, of His presence, and, and just the bread of, of life. They're experiencing all of that. But some of them have actually sewn up the veil because the veil gets us into the power areas. It was in the Holy of Holies where the priest would die if he did not enter in appropriately. In other words, the priest had to be in right standing to enter in there. And now because of Christ, we are in right standing. So we can enter in freely. But the consciousness of, of the holy things of God and of how unholy we are can sometimes make us want to sew up the veil again and close those things. Uh, this course is there for those who want to enter into those deep things and experience the power areas of the Spirit where we heal the sick, where we lay our hands on those who are sick and where they recover, where we drive out the devils, where we enter into the power areas of the Spirit. We function in the gifts of the Spirit. This is what opened up and, and we have so much now that, that we have, uh, we're not even tapping into it. So as we end off, I want you to 
to think of this covenant meal, uh, the shedding of the blood. Uh, think of Isaiah 53 that says that the punishment that brings us peace was upon him and by his stripes you were healed. You've received that and then uh, let us examine ourselves as far as we as we have and partake of this meal. Let, we, let us ensure that we are willing to, to stand on God's word. Let us ensure this. And let us ensure that we are willing also to serve. I mean, yet Jesus washes his disciples' feet. You, you, you know, as we participate of this covenant and, and we are part of a greater body of believers across the nations of the world, we understand that, you know, God has given us all these things. Like I said, we've, we've spoken about so many things in these lectures. I mean, we, we've, we've spoken about the Godhead in, 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 in the first Christian basics. We spoke about uh, the foundational doctrines, personal development, character. We spoke about quiet time. And here we spoke about financial wisdom. We spoke about prayer. And now we speak about the new covenant. Everything that we've spoken about comes into a place where we have to make a decision to really surrender every area of our lives and be willing to die like Christ died to step into that covenant. Um, and I want to take you to Romans 12 where you have to look at it and say, am I willing to sacrifice everything to enter into the power areas of this covenant? And it's going to be a constant choice that I have to make, uh, presenting our bodies, bringing our bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God, so that we can not be conformed to this world and the system, but that we can be the covenant people moving in the, the covenant power and where we can get into the perfect will of God for our lives. That is Heartbeat Christian Academy's vision and mission and heart is to guide and to inspire those that do the courses into the perfect will of God for their lives. I want to thank you for, for doing this course and I want to thank you for working diligently and I want to just implore you to do the other courses just to carry on in your study so that you can grow in the grace and that God can use you in a mighty way. And I'm not sure which course you're going to do next because people don't always do them in the sequence, but I know that I'll be seeing you in the next course. God bless you. And remember, you are God's covenant people. You are blessed. You are victorious. And you do have the authority that Christ has invested in you to take authority over every situation in your life. In Jesus' name, God bless.